This is The Cannamom Show, a podcast chronicling the inspiring stories of real women in the emerging cannabis industry. Your host, Joyce Gerber, mom, lawyer, political activist, has been speaking with women from coast to coast and around the world who are leaders in the revolution of cannabis and caregiving, continuing on her mission to lift up the stories of the women creating the cannabis industry by sharing their cannabis stories with you. So go make yourself a cup of tea or roll yourself a joint, sit back and learn something new about this magical plant on The Cannamom Show with Joyce Gerber. From the Tip O'Neill Studios in North Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's the Cannamom Show. Now here's your host, Joyce Gerber. And welcome back to the Cannamom Show, where all my microphones are working, and I think I can hear the show in my head, so we are good. Yay! <laughs> all systems go. We, but we carried through last week because we are professionals. We've been doing this for five seasons. Five. See, um, I produce and edit the show, Joyce, so the listener might not have noticed any drop off in the quality. So. I don't think I felt like I was screaming in the beginning, though. But then I felt like <laughs> I calmed down at the end. <laughs> Can you? We got every. We still me? got every word. We still got every word. Right. Hysterical. All right. Um, did you watch the Oscars? I did. I did. Did, did you enjoy them? I did. Um, so I know my Jews and cannabis. I talk about Jews and weed a lot. So, um, what did you think? You know that moment of uh. His name is director Jonathan Glazer. He actually said when he won. Uh, so right now we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation, which has led to conflict for so many innocent people, whether you are victims of October 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack in Gaza. So that line, we refute Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked has become very Weirdly controversial. So I have my own take on it, but I don't know if you've heard anything in your I, world. I remember hearing that, but I feel like I didn't get the full backstory. So is, is the guy Jewish and he just decided to renounce his Judaism at that moment? So that's the way it's being portrayed in some of my yeah. Jewish world. But I'm also hearing you can, if commas are important, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's using you know, Jewishness in the Holocaust as an excuse for allowing some of what is happening in the Gaza. That's the other interpretation of it as, um, you know, more. Well, that, that's like, an argument that more than one have made. I don't happen you know. to agree with it, and I have a feeling you don't either. But I mean, I, I, I don't think you can refute your Jewishness. That's kind of the thing. So hmm. I don't know. There's a lot of Jew in the you know, Oscars. There's a lot of Jewish connections this year. You, this year? How about every year? I don't know. <laughs> The Jews, have always, the Jews have been doing just fine. Yeah, and, and as you've seen the film, Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer, Jewish, scientist, Jewish, well, well, Einstein, well, not Jewish. Not, <laughs> well, not only that, not only that, but I, I thought it was a, just a kind of a very interesting moment in the film when Oppenheimer says to one of his colleagues, you know, we're behind in this race, but we have one thing going for us, anti-Semitism, because Hitler thought that it was the Jews' science and so and th there was kind of a fist pump moment for the Jews saying, yeah, we're smart. And if you don't like our math, then you'll you will pay at your own peril. I don't know. We, we exist. We're here. I don't know. And, you know, Barbie, Ruth, what was her name? Ruth Handler, Jewish. <laughs> oh, is that right? Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm a Jew in the world. There's not many of us. I don't us. think, I don't think Barbie's <laughs> Jewish. <laughs> There's I, something about her. <laughs> I don't thought her. She's a, definitely yeah. a shiksa. But, you know, that's how it is when you came here. We understand. Mm -hmm. Whatever. There's not a lot of us. I, I hope what he was saying is he was refuting the idea of using it as an excuse. That is my, I don't know. That's what I want to believe. So I hope that's what he, he said. Um, you can't refute your Jewishness just out there. If you're listening, it's not a thing you can do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, r right. Because, I mean, the argument that I, I, I hear what, he, what he's saying, it's such a delicate topic, as you know, Joyce, and I know that that you've had a, some sleepless nights over the Israel thing, but um, to it, th that would seem nonsensical to say it, if you're making this this sort of nuanced argument that l let's acknowledge all the the strife that Jews have gone through, but but let's not use it as a blanket excuse to slaughter people and starve them. Okay, I hear you, right? But to say that. Now I'm out on the Jew thing. 
Yeah, I have a feeling he he just used the wrong choice of words. And he was shaking. I did notice he was shaking when he said it. And I don't know. That's a tough subject. <laughs> it, it really is. <laughs> I just, but what, uh, it is, what, I, I, I don't, I don't like what? being like, I don't know. It was making me feel uncomfortable. So I'll just put it out there because you know what? I am trying to um, be part of the Jews and Weed event, you know, in Boston. It's coming up. Right. <laughs> Very oh. cool. Uh, what were you going to say? Sorry. No, you know what? It wasn't important. But I will add that I'm glad you enjoyed the um, meme or gif that I made for you. Oh, which yeah. said, Jew, Jews and weed, you can't you can't spell chai without high. So there you go. It's making it round. It's out there. Good. People. All right. And um, so Jews and weed, we exist. We're out there. We met in Vegas. And now we are meeting in Boston. So if you are around on Thursday, March 21st, we will be meeting at New Dia on Lansdowne Street. It's going to be fun. I've invited people who aren't in weed because I just think it's great to bring my people in. And if you, you know, just want to join us, please check it out. Join me. Jews Who Took is sponsoring it. And uh, yeah, we're out there. We're doing our thing. All right. All right. L'chaim. And, one, L'chaim. and one last thing. I don't. Did you get my video? Did I send it to you yesterday? Oh, yes. Would you oh. like me to call that up? Uh, so the Hemp Guitar campaign is in full swing. If you don't remember, uh, the Can Mom Show is giving away a... One of a kind hemp guitar that you can smoke out of and you can play created by Lampkin Guitars. It will be on display at the Goods Dispensary in Somerville, Massachusetts, and we will be doing a live podcast and late breaking news. Dave, Josh yeah. might be there to play it. Oh, wow. Ah! So cool. But we have the, rock, the, the rocker himself. And so we do actually have a video, which I think Dave is frantically trying to pull up if he can find it. <laughs> so, yeah, I have it here, Josh. You want me to play it? Oh, yeah. Play just a little bit. Don't play the whole thing. Yeah, we need to narrate a little bit here. There, there's Josh. Josh I made is sure playing they, the guitar. I made sure they put him in it because I'm a can of mom. <laughs> yeah. It's all the frets, all the things. I don't know. If you're a guitar enthusiast, it you'll looks, like enjoy this. It looks gorgeous. And, and it's you, exciting to, he, to hear him play the can of mom theme song yeah. live. <laughs> so anyways, you might hey, look, there's a bowl. I think this is the one that looks like Saturday Night Live when it comes, it comes up around the bowl. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Well, that's cool. That's hysterical. Anyways, but he, that video that he made on Instagram is trending again. We're almost at a million views. Wow. A million. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> Incredible. People out there, if you want it, go to Lampkin Guitars. Enter your name. Give me a little cash. Just a gift. So we can keep sharing these stories and your name will be entered. You actually don't have to give money because we know that legally as lawyers. But, you know, if you want to support us and, uh, you know, we'll keep sharing these stories that are crushing the stigma around cannabis and caregivers. And you could have a one of a kind, really cool, um, I don't know, collector's item. It's the ultimate conversation piece. It Music really, and weed. Music and weed. All right. Thank you, Dave. And um, so we have a guest today that. She likes music and weed too, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, so today's guest, she is an OG Massachusetts cannabis advocate, one of, if not the very first cannabis mom I ever met. With over a dozen years of local cannabis industry experience, she has had influence in many aspects of the growing cannabis industry in Massachusetts, including her work with Elevate Northeast, where she was on a team of cannabis industry leaders and educators and patients who shared a passion for creating educational programs and experiences that break stigma against the cannabis plant and those who consume and work with it, a mission close to our heart. Today, she is here to talk about specific stigma she has experienced and experiencing again as a pregnant woman consuming cannabis and what she has done and what she's hoping to do advocating for herself and others. Please welcome to the Cannamom Show, Kara Crab Burnham. Welcome. Thank you. So glad to be back, Joyce. I think like the first episode, maybe we'll maybe we'll do them side by side. Maybe we'll like show what it looked like back in the day. It was probably so much thinner. 
<laughs> they needed I, less filters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, nobody gets to be this close to me. Nobody wants to see me up close to the front. Okay. So um, <laughs> welcome. Um, Actually, it was probably on video because back in the day, I did the early ones were video. They were. I uh, We were in a studio in, uh, was it? Wellesley. New Wellesley. Wellesley. I was going to say Newton, but yeah, Wellesley. That's a yep, I right, remember. I'm going to find it. All right. So you have an OG story. It's got a lot of different things, but here today to talk about your pregnancy, what is happening today and what happened before. I don't know how we want to begin, but maybe, um, maybe what happened the first time? I don't know. How do you think this is the best way to share it? <laughs> so, um, I guess not a lot of people know this about me, but this is actually, um, my fifth pregnancy. Oh. I have one living child. Oh. Um, yeah. So, um, when I was 15, my late teens, I was diagnosed with a neurological disorder that causes me to have, um, stress induced tics convulsions that can develop into seizures. And unlike epilepsy, um, not to, no, not to downplay anybody else's seizure disorder, but I'm, I'm a little envious of the ones that are like 30, 60 seconds. Um, my longest episode was four days. Mm. So I was in perpetual physical movement for four days that I was not in control of. Um, and so um, it was there, there have been struggles uh, staying pregnant, I guess you could say. Mm. Um, and during my first pregnancy, which was back in 2016, uh, I was, uh, it was at Brigham and Women's, which is a very, very popular um, birthing labor and delivery hospital in Boston. Um, very highly regarded. It had an amazing doctor who was totally on my side, um, who, who understood. I spent six months transitioning off of my anti-seizure drugs onto pregnancy approved seizure medications. Um, and that was, that was, that was a whole, <laughs> that was oh. a whole other experience. Um, but I, I was, I managed to get onto Lamictal, which is what they do give for epileptic patients, um, which I do not have epilepsy. I don't actually, there's not even a name for what I have. Um, it's just a neurological disorder where my nervous system just spazzes out for days on end. Um, I mean, sometimes they're short and by short, I mean, you know, four hours. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so you're, you're, but you're in a situation where you're, you're, you're using cannabis at a, in yeah. a way that so is allowing they, you to function as a human being in the world and moving forward. And now you're pregnant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So back then, my seizure disorder was a lot more uh, prevalent. I had was having many more frequent, heavy, stronger seizures just on a very regular basis. Um, after so, so I go through this, I go through this process with the hospital, and I told them like I'm, I'm going to have to continue to use cannabis. I'm not willing to give up this medicine that's working for me. If you can't give me an actual scientific, actually scientifically researched study like that and, and several of them that show that there is going to be consequence to this decision. For example, with um, alcohol uh, use or abuse during pregnancy, uh, you, can, you can risk causing a disease called FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm -hmm. And that causes long-term developmental issues in infants and adults and this and this just to clarify so this is a known yeah the harm, FAS unknown, is like a known, unknown, unknown harm and yeah alcohol is not part of the tox screen right that not cannabis unless would be. You, not unless you have a history of it you come in intoxicated or you um you like you're known to you know they, they, but, they, but, they but, check but, the baby they but can look not, at the baby and they can do a study. They can do a test on the baby and say, okay, this baby has FAS. But unlike, unlike, unlike cannabis, cannabis is part of a, a different reasoning for, because they don't know what the, the danger is. Okay. So you come in, it's 2016. It's yeah. early. It's just yeah. adult use. It's just been voted on. And they say to you. They say, well, they said, we're going to go through this rigmarole. You're going to have to go to the social, the social services counselor here at the hospital. They're going to make you, they made me go through the NICU. They made me go talk to 
all of these people around the hospital, I explained to them my situation. They were all like, you have no idea what you're doing and you can't do this. It's super dangerous. And I was like, well, it's, I've lost pregnancies because I have seizures. So what's, what's more dangerous? Like I have proof that, that not using it's dangerous. <laughs> so if you can't tell me that cannabis has an equivalent to FAS, then what are you, what are you, what's the point of all of these conversations? Exactly. So in the end, I ended up, um, I had a very supportive doctor who gave me the phone number to the um, legal department of Brigham and Women's ownership, which is Partners Healthcare. Okay. So I called Partners Healthcare and the head of their legal department and patient discrimination. And I said, this is patient discrimination. I'm a legal card carrying medical marijuana user. I'm buying it through the stores. It's tested. And we, <laughs> we are, you know, I'm doing this the right way. I'm consuming as needed. I'm not over consuming. This, this needs to be an option for me. And if you don't, like if you send DCF into my life, we're going to the news. We're going to the podcasts. We are going to have a, a strike outside of my home when DCF shows up. We are going to we're going to make a scene. We're going to make a scene. And your name is going to be on the front of this for patient discrimination. So this is your choice. Is this what you want to do? Or do you, do you want to make the smart decision and change this policy? And at Brigham and Women, I won. It was like... So, it was oh, so, like only, so even though partners, they own other hospitals. So the only hospital where this is true is at the one hospital because of one patient who did something and went to the top and they said, so nobody at Brigham is tested anymore? Is that how it works? Nobody's tested at Brigham and Women anymore. And nobody has filed a 51A. I mean, they may be tested and the doctor says, hey, we have recommendations about this, but these but are the, the recommendations. And then we all move on. But because there are no, no social services, no people knocking your door, nobody checking on you, nobody telling you you're a bad mom. They do file the 51A for moms who use cannabis during pregnancy. Okay. So that's one hospital. Legal or medical. Adult use or medical. They don't do it because there's no equivalent there's no science behind this decision. Right. And it, I mean, if you're, if you show up and you have other drugs in your system or you have a history of using drugs, that, that those they'll, they'll check for it. I mean, if, if you have, if you, if you're fresh out of rehab, you know, and you know, they're going to check to make sure there's not, you know, cocaine or meth or fentanyl or whatever. Well, again, again like kind of coming back to the, the, the known harm. So we're talking about known yeah. harms, which is really the, yeah. Kara had talked to me the first time about this. Like we know there's a harm with alcohol. We know there's a harm with heroin. We know there's a harm with other medications even. So there needs to be some sort of a way of tracking it. The problem with cannabis, and I say this over and over and over again, is we don't have any data. And we don't have any known harm, so it's unclear why they're testing and testing for the reasons of reporting mothers rather than collecting to figure out and follow the data to figure out if there is a harm, because if there isn't a harm, then we're right. And if there is a harm, then we can help prevent it in a way because we'll know where that comes up. But if you can't collect the data, you can't figure out what the issue is. So, And fast. please come study my seven-year-old <laughs> who's reading at a third grade level. He wants to do division and multiplication. Uh, you know, I mean, he's he's literally reading Lemony Snicket right now for fun. Like, and and again, like you were, we say you talk a lot about the moms. But if you're if you weren't feeling well, if you're having seizures, if you had been doing all sorts of other things that your body was not able to do because you had taken the cannabis out of your system, you could not have parented that child the way that he needed to be parented. And we've been a whole different conversation right now. So okay, let's fa fast forward. So yeah, so so, and I've sent every mom I know to bring up women since. Okay, so good. okay, sorry, I'm having a little. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Okay. So um. So. I uh I have had two I had two miscarriages last year. Oh. Um. And honestly, my seizure disorder has uh has scaled back significantly. I think that uh not to get into any details, but your environment has a lot to do with how your body reacts to things. Uh, and of course. I'm living in a much healthier environment at this point in my life, and my seizure disorder is not nearly as bad as it used to be. Oh, good. That being said, that does not negate the extreme anxiety <laughs> that I deal with on a daily basis. It's well diagnosed solid history of anxiety and depression um and the sciatica 
which is, oh, I don't know if you guys did say it, there's a nerve that runs through your back, uh, out your butt, and then down your leg, and it likes to get stuck in weird places. Um, and I've had that, that was initially diagnosed at 15. It's a lifelong thing until you get a surgery, which I have not had a surgery yet. So that's been acting up. So there's a lot of reasons that I would like to continue insomnia. Oh, I had the worst insomnia this Nausea, point. nausea. For me, not at the beginning. <laughs> so my, my first trimester before I knew I was pregnant, my, my first six weeks, I thought I had, I was like, I, there's no way I'm pregnant because this has just not been going in my favor. Um, and so I was like, I must have some sort of crazy intestinal disease. I was like, maybe there's something wrong with me. I rushed to the hospital. I had lost 10 pounds oh, wow. uh, in like a couple weeks of from nausea, from throwing up and not being able to eat. And then they did a blood test in the ER and they're like, did you know you're pregnant? And I was like, nope. <laughs> that explains this. <laughs> a lot mind body um, connection all right so it wasn't for that but again humans who carry babies have pain and sleep yeah. issues and they don't yeah. want to take medications and women don't i, I mean, can't you can't you can't, can't. they say oh take tylenol well now the, the, what's this class action lawsuit against tylenol causing everybody to have adhd all right like, I, I i took benadryl I, I don't know there was all sorts of weird medications there never would have occurred to me that cannabis could have been something that i could use to help ease some of my pain or other issues so all right. So you're back in this world. You are a yep. human being making a baby inside of you. You also happen to consume cannabis and now yep. you're dealing with a new hospital. So yes, yes now I do not <laughs> live I do not live near Boston anymore. I live near Worcester now and my, that my Which is uh, the cannabis capital of Massachusetts. Man. <laughs> they're worse. There's so much where I've had a terrible experience, honestly. Okay. I live, um, about, I think about seven minutes from Milford Regional and about 35 minutes from St. Vincent. Now my uh, my OB wants me to, that I've been seeing throughout my entire pregnancy, wants me to deliver at um, at St. Vincent. So I, I'm like, okay, let's, I did it once. I can probably do this again, right? <sighs> Can't no. do it. I, I have called patient advocacy at both hospitals. I have talked to maternity wards at both hospitals. Then I reached out to DCF, uh, DPH directly because they said, well, this is a problem. This is a policy at DPH. All right, like, like, that's just because like, I don't even actually understand how this all works. So like, can we kind of go through the levels? Because so if you can understand all the levels of complication, because I keep talking about this, like this is Massachusetts. It's legal everywhere. We, it, we it, it, women are talking about this and why can't we fix it in this state alone? Like we're just having trouble fixing it hospital by hospital. So sort of explain how this policy exists and all the layers that I don't even know. I, I know I know you understand it. So explain it in a way that kind of lays it out so I'll people can to, kind of follow it a little bit. Yeah. Try to go. <laughs> okay. So um, let's see. Okay. So you meet with your OB and you have your doctor who's going to monitor you throughout your pregnancy. There's at least three um ultrasounds that you're going to go through which by the way found this out the hard way the affordable care act does not say that your mid-term pregnancy ultrasound should be covered by insurance so surprise 844 dollar bill anyway off topic it, <laughs> insurance is part of this though we will yeah, get it to it, insurance it, is part yeah, of, of course this. it is yeah Okay. So, okay. So, so you're seeing your doctor, you explain to your doctor because, well, I couldn't even not explain to it because I don't know if you have my chart, you know, the digital age, everything's, everything's in a database somewhere. So I have a, my chart account, which is very common for people to have, which is where all of your medical records, all your test results, all of your visits, all of your messaging to your doctor. If you don't have one, it's a little app on your phone. It's a site on the computer. You can just go in, do everything you need to do with your medical, everything stored there. It's actually a super great tool. It does have in there that I am a medical marijuana user and it cannot be removed. Ever. It can never be removed because it's part of my medical history now. So no matter where I go to have this baby, when they get my social and my name and my phone number, they can pop into my, any doctor, any hospital, any medical facility that has internet can pop into my, my chart and say, oh, she uses cannabis. So there's no getting away from this at this point for me. There's, there's no getting, it's in there forever. And, and again, so we're talking state law, 
federal law. That's why it's so very confusing. And then well, I don't know. Hospitals have their own law, but we're talking about the two different issues. Hospitals so kind don't of have one. laws. Hospitals have policies. That's what I'm talking about. I'm like kidding. Okay, policies. Policies can Please. be changed, but you have to have good, decent people working at your hospital. Okay, so, so we're talking about laws filtering down to policies that are negative, and this is the policy that we're trying to change. Okay. Yeah. So my, so my medical history is there and there's nowhere I can go to hide from this, this fact that I'm a cannabis user. And so, um, or have ever been a cannabis user. Now, if you have ever been through a rehab facility or you, or you have a history of hard drug use and it's in your, my chart, this law, this policy will apply to you as well. Not just for kids, any, any record, any history of drug use that's in your chart. That's mm -hmm. a digital chart that everybody can access every medical professional. So, um, so I go, so, so I tell my doctor that I use cannabis, that I would like to continue to use cannabis, that I find it very helpful for all of these things. I'm losing weight at record amount, like at record speed. I'm like, just pounds are falling off of me, which, you know, a year ago, I was not so okay. mad about <laughs> pregnant, not so good. Um, and so I was like, okay, she says, I don't love it. Okay. And I, and I don't, I don't love it. Cause I don't really know much about it. And okay, I go, well, hold on. I am a professional cannabis educator. <laughs> I got you. So we start going through the stuff. And I'm literally teaching my doctor, the endocannabinoid system. All right. And again, I, I'm going to back up people. Anyone listening to this? I know Kara, but I also know other people across the country who are literally doing the same thing for their medical professionals because they just are not taught it. They don't have time to learn it and they don't know what it is, but they are curious and they want to talk to people who understand it. So here we are in a situation where the patient, again, is helping the medical professionals so they can figure out how to integrate it or if it's really bad or they know stuff you don't know. So, you know, again, okay, so you're moving forward with your doctor. So I'm, I'm talking to my doctor and I explain, you know, this is, this is your endocannabinoid system. This is how it works. This is how my nervous system works. This is how the two systems work together. This is why cannabis works for me. I really want to keep using it. I go back a couple of weeks later and she's like, okay, you're going to use it. I'm not going to pick a fight with you about it. Um, I mean, I'm a very difficult pregnant woman. Like I'm not, I've <laughs> refused the glucose test i have refused to do all all kinds of monitoring and extra sh stuff <laughs> she wants me to do i'm just like no i don't need that thank you um and so uh, you know uh, extra vaccines i've just been like no i'm i'm good we're good thank you uh just the the stuff that's supposed to make pregnant people or just people nervous about their health i'm just not playing into it so so she, she says, you know, okay, go on, live your life, do what we got to do, but what, what are you going to do about giving birth? And I was like, I'm on that next. So step two, I called St. Vincent where she wants me to labor and I call, um, Milford regional, because if there's an emergency, that's where I'm going to end up. If I have to get dragged off in an ambulance, it's right down the street. So, uh, I call them both and I ask to talk to their patient advocates. They're very difficult to get a hold of. I explained to them, you know, I'm a medical marijuana patient. I want to know what your policy is for medical marijuana patients. I'm a longtime user. This is why I'm going to have a baby. I might end up at your facility. I don't want to deal with the 51. Now the 51A. The 51A is the, the form that is completed by a medical professional on behalf of their mandatory reporter policy and is submitted to the Department of Children and Families, DCF, as a reporting the parent as a risk factor for child endangerment. I got that child endangerment. Child endangerment. That's what it is, 51A. Okay. You can file a 51A for a myriad of reasons. You could file it for, you know, somebody having hard drug use in the home. You could file it for an abusive relationship. You could file it for um, neglect. You could file it for any any reason that you think a child is being- but, but marijuana, cannabis, is on the list of mandatory um, reporting uh, substances. Whatever. Yes. The policy includes cannabis on this and you are Brigham and Women's and you got it off of the policy there, but now you're fighting it and I changed it at the whole hospital. So it doesn't matter what doctor you go to. Yeah. So okay, I so go now, back. Okay. 
Okay. So I, I, it's a it's lot, it's a lot of agencies and names and yeah, numbers. there's a lot of, there's a lot happening. <laughs> this has been a saga of my, this, yeah. but this is not helping my extreme difficulties with anxiety. Okay. So basically <laughs> no, no hospital will say to you, we will not file a 51A. It wasn't even just that it was getting ghosted by department heads. It was being refused contact information to the legal departments oh. it was being refused contact information to the next level up management it was being told and i quote but I'm, uh, the head of maternity over at milford regional says to me well you can do whatever you want with your body but once it starts affecting a baby then it becomes our business yes yes and, and in that tone followed by don't tell me how to do my job and I was like, but this is a, she, this is the law. I said, this isn't the law, ma'am. This is a policy. And like, it's not the law. I've checked, I've checked on that. I'm a hundred percent sure that this is a policy that you are entirely in control of. Right. And she, she, again, she's like, don't tell me how to do my job. So were you it's able to, law. were you able to access the legal department? I, I don't even know who owns those hospitals. Who owns those hospitals? I don't, I was not at any point able to access wow. legal departments. They would not allow me the contact information. The woman at Milford hung up on me. That's when I just gave up on them. I was like, you're not even, you're not even willing. So then I, so then I was like, okay, I go back to my doctor. I go back and I was like, what is going on? Like, this is wild. This, we can't be, we can't be doing this to people. And she goes, listen, this is after I have a conversation with her where I say, I'm going into labor naturally. We're not doing Pitocin, which is induction of labor. We're not popping the water. We're not breaking my water. We're not doing an epidural. We're not doing a C-section. Like I'm going to giraffe babies fall six feet in front to the ground when they're born. That is your welcome to earth moment. You know, I'm, I'm doing this like a giraffe. Like this is what, <laughs> this is my I, plan. <laughs> I had the exact opposite reaction. I was like, went into labor so early in the morning. Didn't even know it was happening. I get there at five. I'm like eight centimeters dilated. I'm like in writhing in pain. She's like, do you have a plan? I'm like, no. I'm like, do you want pain meds? I'm like, of course I do. Do I look like someone who doesn't need pain meds? And I they couldn't do, but they couldn't give me an epidural. They had to give me like, I don't even know what I was thinking. Like, this is this crazy thing about can mumming. They are perfectly fine giving you an, a needle like the size of my head and sticking it between two vertebrae in my back while I'm writhing in pain, but they won't let me take an edible to help calm me down. Like, does that make any sense? No, it does not. It's fentanyl. <laughs> Your epidural is more often than not full of fentanyl. Anyways, it does make you feel calm, but it probably is a better way. To... Anyways, okay. So you're saying well, I this don't is want what this. I say all this yeah. to my doctor. I say, we're doing the minimum amount of medical intervention. I'm just seeing you on the regular basis. I'm supposed to see you just to make sure that everybody's growing correctly, that we're all healthy and safe. And if I am concerned about my sugar intake, I know the signs of diabetes. My dad has diabetes. I watch if you start falling asleep after you have a piece of bread, you probably need to go get that checked out. I'm watching myself. I eat super healthy anyway. Like I, I'm on a FODMAP diet most of the time. So it's all salads and lean meats okay. for me. Um, I'm, very, I'm not worried about any of it. <laughs> she, God loves the medical industry. She comes yeah. back to me and says, well, if you will schedule your birth, take the Pitocin, let me pop your water, and we can just do this birth on my schedule, then I won't report you. To, I won't file the DCF because I have control over that. That being said, once the baby is delivered, you're required to send the baby to the, not the NICU, but the... Uh, the nursery the nursery yeah, yeah. where they they can th th where the nursery doctor will then look at my my chart where it says i'm a cannabis user and they don't know me and they may choose to, do to a follow screen. hospital policy and file a 51a so i said okay so we're going to do everything i don't want to do in my birth plan just so that you can not so that I can have no security against like being for in, in favor of being protected against this discriminatory policy. So what, like what? It is not helpful. <laughs> right, not so, helpful. You're, 
So you're so you're stuck where a lot of women are who probably don't have resources and didn't even have the sense that there is an ability to fight this. So you're in a position where you're giving birth in a hospital. Everyone knows what's going on with you. You're using this in a medical way in a state where it's legal, where lots of people are making money on it and doing compliance stuff. But that's another conversation we can probably have a little later. And <laughs> you're just you're, you're feeling stuck. And this is just one hospital in one state. And this is happening to women or two hospitals, technically. And this is happening to women across the country in every hospital. And I know that in the state of Arizona, I don't know if you've been following this, there was a woman um, who actually fought back after children, whatever family services were connected because of the talk screen. And now they aren't allowed to do the talk screen if you're using cannabis with your medical professional. So mm -hmm. I don't, how does that happen in Massachusetts? Like what's going on? Why, why is this not getting fixed? Well, okay. So then, you know, the activists inside me, I was like, okay, I'll just fix this. It's got to fix it. It can't be that yeah. hard. So I called DPH, Department of Public Health. Department of Public Health mandates a lot of these, you know, they, they handle most of these mandatory reporter policies and determine when and how they should be, you know, issued to DCF. So those two organizations, they work closely. Mm -hmm. So DPH, I call them, I'm on the phone. I'm like, explain this to me. They're like, there's, it's the hospital. It's entirely individual doctors. It's the individual doctor. They have they have the right to do it or not do it. If they think you're in danger, or if they don't think you're in danger, if you if you're that's totally up to them. I said so. Any hospital, any doctor can make this decision independently of the hospital of the medical facility. They're like, yeah, we have. It's just a suggestion. It's literally just a suggestion from DPH that you so test like, for cannabis or that you report yeah, that you report that you test and that you report. So they could, so DPS could say, take the suggested out and they would not DPH, DPA, well, no, they won't do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, why well, is it out? And they're like, mm. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's going to be like lawyers and lawsuits and class actions. And there's going to be, there's going to be a lot that goes into that. Okay. The so way a lot went into okay. it in Arizona that I'm just not in a position to. Right. Okay. So we have the department. Back. The Department of Public Health says we think that you should probably check for cannabis because there might be some kind of danger. And you, if you test and it's there, you have to report it because you're no, a you're suggested. Reporter. No, oh, but the doctor, but the doctors believe if they are finding something that has a danger, they have to report it. So in their head, it's a danger, so they have to report it because they don't know any better. They don't even they don't know, they're better. not even taught the ECS. How are they going to know any better? Like okay. the medical, right, so their medical degree has failed them already. Like, all right, so D DPH they can't help you because okay, what's so what's the next level up? D DCF. So I okay, go to DCF. So I go, oh my gosh, what is going on with this, you guys? Children and family services, yeah. yeah children okay. and family, yeah. So I have this whole long conversation with DCF about like, there, that there's no equivalent to FAS. That why are you even accepting these? Why are you doing these investigations if it's just cannabis? And there's no equivalent. That, and she, the lady. There's no harm. Like, if, it's, if they don't no know harm. what the harm is, how can you be testing for harm if you don't know what the harm is? It's sort of a. How can you circle. claim harm, child endangerment, if you don't know what it is? And their risk, they, 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 they said, we'll get back to you. And I, I wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, so plan Z. Okay. 1.5, right? Um, home birth. So what, can, I, can I ask you one more? Can I ask you one more policy? So what if the state said, "Okay, we're going to make it a law. You are not allowed to test any hospital that functions in Massachusetts. Is not allowed to test do a talk screen on a." Then that would of... be policy overriding medical health and decisions, and I don't, I don't personally know if that's right either. Yeah, I think that. I I mean I don't know. I, I don't know if I haven't, I haven't I mean, basically, basically it's, exactly it's, it's, how to fix this. It's the health professional's mindset. Like the health professionals yeah. believe it's dangerous, but the problem, like I kind of said this earlier. So the problem is if you don't have data, how are you going to know whether or not it's dangerous? It's a little confusing for people, mm -hmm. but if you aren't allowed to collect data because women are not feeling comfortable telling people that they're using cannabis during their childbirth and those children aren't followed, then you don't really know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, and I will say, this is the thing that kind of, kind of opened my eyes to this as I spoke to an emergency room doctor in California who said she shifted her idea of what cannabis is because when the ER people, for some reason, they were doing talk screens on everybody, regardless, whatever. And somehow she could see that the people using cannabis without the other substances were better 
And it kind of like, because she saw the data at, in front of her eyes, you know what I mean? So again, you're not going to do tests on pregnant women. We're not going to do pharmaceutical. We're not going to do testing on pharma women, but women are using cannabis when they're pregnant for a lot of reasons, you know, hyper, the throwing up thing. Yep. Hyper I hyper, yeah. I should learn how to say that. Uh, that one I talked to women about just the idea that you can't sleep. You know, I was told to take Benadryl. Like, really? You think Benadryl? Uh, We're told explicitly you are not allowed to take Benadryl during your pregnancy at all anymore. My mother smoked. Benadryl's so. on the- it, there's been a bit of big, you know, she went from smoking cigarettes to. <laughs> yeah, right. I said in eight years between, well, seven years since when I had my son, my first son to to this son, I, you know, things have changed. Things I'm supposed to do yeah. or not supposed to do, you know. Sure, that's good to I see. mean, depending on what country you go to. I was pregnant in Greece during my first labor. And a guy wouldn't serve me, like a cafe owner refused to serve me, co- refused to serve me coffee. You denying a pregnant woman caffeine? I swear to God, I I lost my mind on that one. But like, um, you know, there are also people telling you you can't dye your hair. Well, in the 80s, you couldn't dye your hair when you were pregnant because they were very harsh chemicals. Now, who cares if you dye your hair? It's not the same chemicals and compounds. Like things change. We've evolved. We go, oh, we really shouldn't eat deli meat. Because there might be a bacteria in it. Well, there might be a bacteria in anything. You telling me that all the Japanese women in the world, none of them eat sushi for the nine months they're pregnant? Please, please. So, all right. So, culturally, pregnancy across the country—that's a whole nother show. All right. So, oh. <laughs> we've talked about how difficult it is. Uh, I don't. We don't know what the solution is. We, you know, it's out there. I know. I wanted to tell your story because I talk about sort of like anecdotally about what's going on with women. So, I mean, do you have anything like? I know actions. I know you're frustrated, but I'm so frustrated. Well, okay. So my, my last plan of action to have this baby where I wasn't going to be discriminated against or have some policy enacted upon me that was inappropriate, um, was to have a home birth. So I was like, okay, let me start looking at this. So how can I have this baby in my living room? Which my husband is very much like, I want to have a baby in the living room. Um, I'm like, yeah, I want to have a baby in the living room. What's the big deal? I'm a giraffe. Um, so, (laughs) so, um, we, I go to, you know, I go on my insurance company website and okay, midwives, let me find one. I find, you know, there's a couple in this area. I call them, they go, oh, well, we don't take insurance. I was like, well, how come you're listed on my insurance thing? Well, I guess my insurance company covers Rhode Island too. So if I was living in Rhode Island, I would have access to midwives. Oh, really? But now as a Massachusetts resident, Massachusetts residents, insurance in the state of Massachusetts, like as a policy, again, policies destroying our world. Um, The policy for Massachusetts insurance is to not cover midwives and home births. So if you know people who have had a midwife come to their house and have done a home birth, they have paid for that out of pocket, which can be up to $10,000. So I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so I do know several, and I hadn't actually thought about, like, you really want to do that whole birth if you're going to do it that way. You have to pay out of pocket for that whole thing, for your nitrous oxide, for the tub, for your monitoring, for everything. That's all out of pocket. I know. I was a drug, give me drugs, stay in the hospital for a few days. I feel relaxed kind of girl, so I did. <laughs> but now I'm in cannabis. Maybe if I had smoked cannabis back then, it would have been different. Um. All right. So <laughs> I, probably. Probably. Uh, um, all right. We have a couple more minutes. Um, you're more than just a pregnant woman. I know that's hard to believe. You, you know a lot about yeah, I'm, this. I'm a walking uterus, according to the United States of America's policies. So that is true. Um, so you know, uh, cannabis. It's a compliance industry. It's all about compliance. It's literally all it is is compliance. You know all about compliance. You're in this deep in compliance. You've been doing this for a long time. You're frustrated with the compliance. So I don't know. You just wrote something. Do you want to just sort of spill whatever you want to talk about for five minutes <laughs> about compliance in Massachusetts? I don't know. Yeah, well, I just, um, the um, Institute of Cannabis Science just launched a new um, blog article series for their website, and I was the inaugural, or the initial, not inaugural, the initial writer for this launching of this this series, um, which came out today. today. We're recording on the 13th. (laughs) Um, (laughs) so that came out today and um it's been you know it's been a couple hours but it's been receiving some pretty good feedback uh I talk a lot about 
honestly, the naivete that comes from being an activist. I believed that cannabis was different, that Mm -hmm. cannabis as an industry would be better. We would be more wholesome. We would be people first. We would be human centric. We would be holistic in in all of these wonderful, beautiful, altruistic ways. Um, And everybody was going to be focused on keeping people out of jail. Everybody was going to be focused on protecting moms. Everyone was going to be focused on getting patients healthy again and getting them quality care and good medicine at affordable or even free because it's a freaking plant. Like this is this is not that complicated. It's hard to grow really well, especially when you are trying to make the outdoors indoor. I get this. I get. All, I I know. I know these things. But I believed that it would be different, and I have some, a lot, a bit, enough mm-hmm. resentment and guilt about working so diligently for so many years. I've been in this space for 15 years, Mm -hmm. getting people jobs, training people, vocational training, helping people get these businesses open, you know, working through compliance issues, working with the CCC, working on all of these issues. I I didn't even talk about the Northeast Regional Cannabis Symposium. I was going to ask about that, but we'll get back yeah to for, else. for the lot, workforce yeah for, for the workforce the work- that's where she focuses that was a symposium she held last this year this year last yeah. year last year last year october last year. uh august end of august okay. um and and now and now i have all i see are chads mm. all i see are cash grabs i see people's business plans written you haven't even opened a business and you've got an exit strategy mm. like it's not tech it's not tech. Tech. That's, I tech have heard that. I've seen that thing. Like, why are you entering if you have an exit plan? And again, I only talk to women in the industry, usually caregivers, and it's a different vibe. Most of them are here because they're evangelized or pissed off that they didn't have it before. There's several reasons, but they're staying in it for a certain perspective. So when I meet men, I'm always like, wow, there are men here too. But I have seen this. There's thing. actually more men than women. <laughs> Way more men. But again, I've been seeing this on you, like the biz world of cannabis. And it's all about, it's a buyout. People are buying people out and they're treating it like tech and they're treating it like a thing that's different. And again, she's a plant. She's a plant. She's a woman. She's a female plant. She's a caregiver plant. Women exist until the Supreme Court says we don't. And I really do. And Kara is one of those people who, but she's a pioneer and it's frustrating and it can be heartbreaking that this industry could look differently and it could be built differently. It could be, it could have been, it could have been if people listened to the act to, to the activists and, and not the money, but the money came in and, and when the money came in more often than not money is held by men, whether we like it or not, more money is in every other industry in every aspect of the world, more money is held by men. It's like, Oh, look, a female billionaire. You know, that's always exciting. You see a female <laughs> millionaire, self-made or whatever, you know, you know, when you see a man, it's like another man making money, you know, it's like just, more just, money hold is held by men than women. So right, when so the cannabis so industry yeah. grows and has more money coming into it, more men came in and you see that CEOs that, that high now was 36. I think when I got involved, 36% of CEOs in cannabis were women, which was above and beyond any other industry in the world and little by little by little over the years it's come down every freaking year it has come down and when it's come down you know what has gone up it OSHA complaints have gone up uh bad workplace policies have gone up discrimination has gone up harassment has gone up um I mean this not to like poop on men but but again, it's kind of, kind of back to, I don't know if they're connected, but this is what's happened. But it's how, but how, again, businesses are run a certain way because there are certain decisions made by some certain people at a certain time. And those are the rules and the rules are made up. So, and I don't know how to change the world. I do a podcast from my daughter's bedroom, but I do <laughs> feel like there are enough women who I know personally, like literally personally, who are in this industry, who have money and resources and knowledge, like the knowledge that you own and the Northeast people own the lawyers we know, you know, doing it in a different way. It's always about the money coming in because that's what's, we decided to treat this before we let it really kind of grow and have doctors accepted and nurses accepted in the medical world. 
we decided we were going to make money off of it. And now here we are. Mm -hmm. But we still are here and it's still a new industry. I still have hope and you're still here. So um, we're not going to end on a bad note because we're actually over time. So what do you think? The vision from Massachusetts, you know, if it's something great, I don't know. What's the next thing? You've been involved in lots of different levels and different things in Massachusetts. We need we need to like go back to our roots as a state. We need to have a real conversation about how we're protecting patients, how we're protecting moms, how we're protecting the workforce. And we need to not prioritize, you know, Chad's bankroll. Like, I'm sorry. Like he's just not the priority. That cannot be the priority. I mean, I love, I love, I, I love making money. Making money is great. Super fun. Great thing. <laughs> I love paying my mortgage. <laughs> it's awesome. Great feeling every month. Um, but it, 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 as an industry, as a plant, as, as a piece of nature, as a piece of nature, it, this cannot be the only priority. Amen. Although I did go into to make money and so did you, but we are. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get in it to make money. I <laughs> I was like, well, maybe I can make money after we legalize it. That would be cool. That's yeah. been a lot harder said than done. I know. It's craziness. All right. <laughs> but we are changing it and we're adding a new voice and we're existing in this world. And you change one hospital. We're going to happen in Worcester. It's going to happen across the state. I talked about this endlessly. I'm a manifester now because I smoke pot. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right so that is the show a little bit longer than lo usual but thank you thank you Kara, for joining us today and there we go for my guests Kara crab burnham and of course for my can of road david yaz and my can of mom show team i want to thank you for taking the time to listen to the can of mom show where we are on a mission to enhance the impact women have on the emerging cannabis business industry by sharing and preserving their stories of love kindness wisdom and hope thank you for listening and sharing the inspiring stories so that together we'll crush this stigma around cannabis and caregivers i'm your host joyce gerber this is the Cannabis mom show and we're a production of pod 617 the boston podcast network